Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Kitabi Karwan podcast. Today's podcast is in association with Bloomsbury Publishing India. Today we have with us Shabni Basu whose latest book The Mystery of the Parsi Lawyer along with her former books Victoria and Abdul for King and Another Country all fall under in her own words descriptive non-fiction as a genre. I absolutely loved reading her new book because for me personally it introduced me to a side of history which I was never exposed to a side of discrimination faced by expatriate Indians in the UK and a very fascinating case which well as you delve into this interview you'll hear it yourself so without any further ado let's jump right to it so shabani welcome to the kitabi karwan podcast uh I am so glad to have you here. I just finished reading your book a couple of days back and I have way too many questions for you but the first question that I have for you is something that I ask all authors who come on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Tell us something about yourself which you won't find on the internet or on the blurb of your book. <laughs> you won't find anything about me on the internet anything that's uh, <laughs> you know outside my because I'm actually a very private person so there's nothing oh. you'll never see family photos holiday photos or anything you know that's not what I do uh, right. but yes uh, what do I do I'm a journalist so yeah. um, you know the day job is journalism which I love mm-hmm. I've been doing mm-hmm. that you know I started in the Times of India when I was just 20 years old <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's been my journey um, and uh, what do I do otherwise apart from the journalism is the writing the books apart from that right. I just love the, you know I love gardening <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. So I spend a lot of time in the garden. I like growing my own vegetables. I like I love pottering in the garden. It's it's very therapeutic, very relaxing, uh, and of course, you know, just being with friends, watching films. What else? Just like anybody else, really. <laughs> yeah. That's that's actually very fascinating to know because I find I always find it very interesting when I find people having private. Like I mean, it's great that people have their own private lives. But the day and age we live in, like the modern era, Mm -hmm. it's so fascinating for people. Like you mean you don't have family photos or this thing online. But that's a great choice that you've made in life. But Mm -hmm. let me just jump towards your book. And Mm -hmm. the first question I need to ask you is, how did you just, how did you come across this? How did you decide to write about George Adalji? Because, okay, uh, till the point I read this book, I considered myself to be somewhat of a history buff right someone who's read not not trying to brag you but just I thought I, w- I knew history or at least the major events that have happened in the world I would have heard of them and surprisingly mm-hmm. this wasn't one of them and the more I read mm-hmm. your book the more angrier I got not just at myself but at like I don't know at in the way history is taught in India or how people are taught about Indian incidents because mm-hmm. this has absolutely never come up and no, yeah so no. it just it's just quite like, how did you come up with this or just what motivated you to write about this? Hmm. Well, you know, I've always, uh, as a journalist, I've always loved finding these hidden stories. Uh, yeah. And I've lived half my life in India. I came to London when I was 25. I didn't know anything about any of these people in India. You know, I didn't even know that Indian soldiers were active in the Western Front in trenches, you know, that there were turbans in these trenches. It's just stuff I didn't know when I was studying in India. And believe me, I studied history. I did my master's in history. Um, so it's just that these things are missed, you know. And I had never heard of Noorin Ayat Khan, who I've written the biography of. Uh, my biography is by Princess, which, again, nobody knew about her when I was writing this book. Um, and now she's known all over. Uh, Victoria and Abdul, another book where, you know, nobody had heard. It was a story that had been erased from history. And I bought this man up, you know, Abdul Karim. And now he's, uh, you know, he's now in a film and he's smiling down. <laughs> he was uh, from Leicester Square looking at everybody. <laughs> so that that was all fun. So this is my passion. I love bringing out these hidden characters who've been forgotten in history, but who played a very important role at some point. Yeah. And so, you know, in my sort of, uh, let's say, filing cabinet of interesting characters, I had George Adalji filed away a long time back because what is more fascinating than Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, investigating the only case that he ever personally investigates is to do with an Indian. I mean, you know, that was like, my radar was like, oh my goodness. So uh, he was always there. But what happened is, I was researching Victoria and Abdul, I, you know, I've done quite a few books, so it always takes me a long process. In, yeah. And I was in between other books. And um, Julian Barnes, the author, novelist, he published yeah. a book called Arthur and George. 
and yeah. that was about the Hidalgi yeah. case. And you know, he's such a famous writer. It's a fiction, of course, uh, mm -hmm. but he'd covered it, and he's he he's covered some parts of the case, and. Um, that was it. I said, okay, this is shelved. So I sort of shelved that project. Uh, yeah. But it was in 2015 that I saw um, a little article in a newspaper. I read the newspaper from end to end, believe me. And I always look for the little briefs, you know, because there's always something hidden there. Yeah. Um, anyway, I saw this article say, saying that uh, some letters were going to be auctioned. They were going to come mm -hmm. up at Bonham's yeah. for auction. And they were the letters of uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle written to the chief inspector of police of Staffordshire, which is where this, and they de dealt with this case. Yeah. And it was like a light bulb, you know, I said, okay, it's a sign. I've got to find out there must be something new because for me, I like to do something new. You know, what's, it, it is nonfiction, it is the fact, but I've got to find something different that has never been written about before. Right. And that is a sort of passion with me. So I felt here it is, you know, I've got to follow this up. So I followed up those letters, followed their path. They were finally bought by a library um, in Portsmouth. And I went to see these book, you know, these boxes and boxes of letters and um, police records. And they were such a revelation because I could see Arthur Conan Doyle's passion. He's writing yeah. so many letters. He's gone on honeymoon and he's writing letters <laughs> he's in his honeymoon. Yeah. You know, his poor wife, there are these letters from Venice and Dresden and he's just mm -hmm. traveling, but they're, they're on the hotel, you know, note paper. Okay. So I could just, I had this picture of, you know, his poor wife sitting there like, is this my honeymoon or is this George Adalci's honeymoon? Okay. Uh, you know, so it just, it was amazing. And yeah. um, of course, what, what, also came across was the amount of hate and abuse that had been directed towards this poor man. And that was really something. And of course the police chief and his involvement, how he tries to, um, he actually tries his best not to let Arthur Conan Doyle succeed. So it's, it's a whole lot of tussle that goes on. Um, and of course that then set me on the trail. So then I went to all the other places yeah. and collated all the material. Yeah, because so just addressing the first thing that you said, like, you know, how it's mm -hmm. Arthur Conan and Doyle, mm -hmm. Doyle examining the only one of the only cases that he examined. Like I read the cover, the extended title of the book, and I was just taken away mm -hmm. because it's just not a phrase that you generally hear, right? Like the Parsi lawyer and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle being involved together, right? But and yeah, I read about your story, like you do write about it in your foreword, I guess, like about when you went to the library and how you were disappointed when you first saw that they asked you to leave because when you were examining the letters. And then <laughs> that was the auction really house. <laughs> right. It's, so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, and I get it. And something that just crossed my mind while reading the book and actually towards mm -hmm. the end when you, you know, when we start hearing about the latter half of George's, George's life, when he and his sister, both of them never get married, they die, and mm -hmm. they're anyway estranged mm -hmm. from their brother or his. So I think one of the things that kind of caused this incident to fade into history is also the fact that, well, there were no descendants to the family who actually cared about the process of yeah. justice being carried forward, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you hear of everyone... Mm -hmm. A lot of the mm -hmm. other historical things that we hear about are just descendants fighting for justice or like at least taking the cause up or writing, having memorials, trust, something or the other, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it's always very heartening to like see someone like you, right? Like someone who's just taking up something mm -hmm. which has, I mean, for all intent and purposes, the only thing, there's nothing that we could be doing about George Adalji right now, right, with this book, but <laughs> at least it ensures his... Whatever the discrimination he faced is just something brought to light, right? Is and, is known, yeah, yeah, widely yeah. known because nobody's heard of George Adalji, you know, despite Julian Barnes's yeah. novel or whatever. It's yeah. it's it's something that most people say, what you know, Arthur Conan Doyle investigated mm -hmm. this man's case. We've right. never heard of him, and that right. is uh, you know, it's quite so, something, yeah. So I uh, so something that I actually was wondering while again just going through the book because something that constantly kept coming back to me was how so we see how George just faces this barrage from people around him right like everyone doubts the vicarage everyone doubts uh, George till the point Arthur Conan Doyle stands up for him right so mm -hmm. it's basically yeah. a white man champion standing up for someone's discrimination which causes them to yes. and mm -hmm. it, it's not them recognizing the discrimination it's just them choosing to yeah. believe another white man over it 
Absolutely. So, and especially the white man being Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, the most right. famous writer of the time. So I right. think that made a huge difference. Hmm. Right. And and I'm sure like if say it was someone like say Jerome to Jerome, right? Maybe mm-hmm. that might not have caused the same for as say like a crime thriller writer or someone who investigates mm-hmm. crime standing up for someone being innocent. Like that's just a different body to yeah. it altogether. But yeah. Yeah. So, so I what I actually was wondering about was what you went through while researching this book, right? Because as mm-hmm. an Indian who's been in England for 20 odd years, and I hope there aren't too many instances of it, but I'm sure you have faced some form of maybe a direct or indirect discrimination or maybe just being mm-hmm. snubbed or something of that sort. And reading about such heavy forms of discrimination, right? Some, some blatant forms of discrimination where someone was prosecuted for their almost their entire life. Mm-hmm. How does an author or like a journalist process their feelings in this situa- situation? Because I can imagine this is very heavy or very, I don't know, something takes a toll on you to process mentally and physically or emotionally for that matter. It is because when you when I saw all the letters and you know I have I have them in the book I actually have some illustrations of the things that were shown yes. scraps of paper thrown inside um, letters saying you know we'll kill you black man Hidalgi the works and um, first the first bit of letters and hate mail against this family uh, starts when George is just twelve years old so can you imagine what his father was feeling at this stage it's also in many ways, a story of a father and a son, because he just sticks right. up for him the whole time. And this is a father who's come from India. So he's come right. from Bombay. He was a, he's a Parsi, but he rejected his Parsi faith. He's a convert. He became a Christian. Right. Uh, he said, you know, my own faith is not, um, is, uh, you know, this is the real civilization. So he had this, right. you know, very rose-colored view of, English civilization and he comes here right. and then of course he's you know he's at the receiving end of it he's he's not getting what he thought it would be and right. um, you know his son is being targeted uh, as a child he's being targeted this is like hugely distressing for him um, so right. you know you can just feel the anxiety this family this only Indian family in this village um, is facing and to top it all he's the vicar of this village you know so every Sunday he's standing up there and he's talking to a white uh, parish Um, and he has a very pronounced Indian accent you know he's a brown man what is he facing and um, so all this is uh, is difficult but what also struck me is that my goodness you know this could be happening now this happened over a hundred years ago but here we are (laughs) You know, uh, just, you know, till last week, the papers here were just full of Harry and Meghan, you know, the palace talking about the color of this uh, child's skin before he's born. So it just, you know, it brought that whole race debate once again, right in the heart and center of British politics. And um, we had Black Lives Matter last year, you know, in the lockdowns, there's been so much churning that's gone on. Um, Asians have been targeted, have been hit the most by the pandemic. They're the ones who've died, and so right. the most. So you, you know, it just makes you think, what happened? You know, what's happened in this country? Why did nothing change? Why is there so much trolling of anyone who stands up and questions the system? You know, you don't get these yeah. anonymous letters anymore, but you have trolling, you have, you yeah, have hate you have- mail in so many ways. So, um, and again, it's not just England. I mean, it's happening all over the world. So, you know, this sort of, hatred of the foreigner, immigrants, keep immigrants away, build walls. We saw what happened in the US, you know, it's just, um, it's a global thing. Exactly. So for me, it was also the fact that this is so relevant, you know, police planting evidence, police um, miscarriages of justice, everything still happens. Uh, You know, this happened to George over a hundred years ago, but uh, you know, here we are and we're still seeing this. So that made it really relevant for me and, you know, put it somewhere in the present day as well. Okay. So I'm, I'm quite curious because, and here, this is somewhat not related to your book, but rather mm-hmm. just the idea of mm-hmm. discrimination in general, right? Because mm-hmm. the more I think about it, always just boils down to this idea of othering, right? And it mm-hmm. might, it's not just limited to race in that sense, right? In India, it's no, no. caste is a huge yeah. problem. Gender, gender, gender discrimination, 
right exactly. Se- based on sexuality on and loads of other things and it's always mm-hmm. trying to just draw this differentiation right it's not me it's this other person who's doing something mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. and as you said it's a global issue it's not just that it's just india or uk or some other countries who do it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i know like do you have like have you ever thought about why why is it that we as humans have this tendency or this i know innate psychological need to you know draw differences rather than mm-hmm. a, you know embrace homogeneity or like like rather see ourselves for what is in common mm-hmm. between us rather than the differences yeah i think it's insecurity it's always insecurity i mean you know people who want to attack others saying you know you are taking my jobs or right. who do you think you are um is all because they are so insecure in their own skin i think it just comes from that sense basically you know when your kids you can have you know children playing together and they are not aware of each other's skin color you know they don't care what you wear what you do so it's not something that uh, you know happens unless it's planted on you and i think as you grow old the society is telling you certain things and it's people's uh, illiteracy levels ignorance and i think at the i think the top level is this insecurity that you feel the threat from somebody else you know the immigrant the foreigner uh, a black person asserting his rights you feel threatened you know why are you saying this so the the constant refrain will be we are not a racist country uh, okay. well of course everybody is a racist and it's also very important you know say that at this point you know it, this is very dark but it's also very important to remember that not everyone is and there are equal number of people fighting very hard even where, whatever issues there are women uh, women's issues or ge- you know not just gender but um race the mm-hmm. george adalji himself it wasn't just arthur conan doyle there was a petition for him signed by 10000 people they were all white they were lawyers they were doctors they were his school teach you know people who went to school with him people who knew him or people who didn't know him at all and who just felt injustice has been done so 10000 people and we're talking you know that's a lot of signatures for way back in the day to right. mobilize uh so there were always people there are always those who will pull you down there are always those who support you so you know that is something that you have to always remember they're not it's not all black and white you know that yeah it's it's great that you pointed this out because i also thought about this while reading the book that as someone who's studied about the uk as an outsider right like as an indian student studying about the uk mm-hmm. or particularly because of our history of the freedom struggle and everything we yeah. are always we always tend to perceive early 9th 20th century england as a very racist place due to mm-hmm. because most of the incidents that we are often taught or just told about mm-hmm. are incidents of race violence or race discrimination and mm-hmm. that that is a dissonance i noticed while reading the book right like my inherent bias trying to tell me wait this doesn't seem right i mean how did he manage so much support in a racist country and then what you said actually made absolute sense mm-hmm. it's always it's never black and white there are always uh, yeah, yeah. people there but and yeah like it just very fascinating like so again if i can just draw back to your research right how did mm-hmm. you uh, like uh, what were your what were the sources beyond the letters or the publicly available sources that you mm-hmm. referred to because mm-hmm. uh, what really got me uh, got me about your book was the fact that uh, you managed to capture a lot of the at least from what my perspective a lot of the thought process behind characters for pet say negative sides right like say the police officer anson's uh, way of looking at george adalji or the way uh, there were certain evidence was uh, regarded by him so i mean i find it very difficult to believe that you know just letters that will kind of give you that insight like what was the na- the step beyond that which you took yes of course no it's not just the letters the letters were just the starting point um after that i go to um i went to the national archives in kew uh which mm. has the home office files so i looked at all the home office files in the case which also have the police records um mm. the account of the trial um then i went to staffordshire so there were four archives which had records uh, birmingham staffordshire kew which is the national archives and uh, portsmouth so between four libraries i looked at home office papers i looked at letters i looked at um, newspaper reports i 
for me a lot of my, you know, just the sense, the narrative, what are people feeling outside these three characters? What is the general sense of the public? And the only place you can find that is from the newspapers. So the reporters go into this village and they report, you know, what are the people discussing? Because this case had, even when the murder, you know, these uh, slashing of these animals was happening, this case had been reported widely. He's called the Whirly Ripper. It's happening a few years after Jack the Ripper. So there's this fear, this complete terror, this real fear. And um, so, you know, what are the reporters writing? They go to the village and they are saying how people are scared, but they're discussing this. And what are they saying? Why is George, uh, you know, when George is arrested, what are they saying? They are saying that maybe it's because he comes from the Orient, you know, Eastern, rituals they think these are the people who are going to sacrifice animals at night um, these are the sort of theories that the villagers yeah. are coming up with it yeah. comes from ignorance you know they they know that parsis are they don't understand what zoroastrianism is it's all yeah. you know it's a big mix to them hinduism they've seen they've read about the thuggy cult and you know sacrificing animals to kali um, they're confusing that with zoroastrianism they said these are the people who worship the, the sun and the moon. That is why he's going into the forest. Um, there's also this color, you know, look at it like the Eastern, the Oriental is some lover of mysteries. He's a dark character. Yeah. This is fueled through the literature. You know, it's like a Kipling vision of the thing. It's through the histories yeah. they see, you know. So everything comes together and there is this this image of this Indian who is, you know, who does these dark, mysterious things, you know, um, and uh, that is, and all that sense of what, because obviously I wasn't there a hundred years ago, how else do I know what these villagers were thinking is through all these, you know, the newspaper reports, but at the same time, there are villagers who support George, you yeah, know, so yeah. it's always, there's always somebody there and they, they tell, uh, they help Arthur Conan Doyle because, they have their suspects right. and they think George is innocent. So, you know, there's a lot of things happening there, right. but I use a lot of newspaper reports. I use weather forecasts. What was the day like? You know, was it a rainy day? Was oh, it okay. uh, everything, you know, because the story is about then, you know, you have all the facts, you've got to, you've got to narrate it. Right. You've got to get a, you've got to bring the color into it. And uh, so you, you do all the other research around this to find out and bring in the color into the story. And uh, now when you mention it, just that very interesting fact that you mentioned, right? When, when it comes about this image that was conjured in people's heads about uh, this Orientalist man who did Orientalist things. Uh, because when you were st uh, started talking about Arthur Conan Doyle in your book also, you mentioned that his books, which mention India, are also quite, I mean, yes. it's not a blatantly racist, but maybe there is this form of ignorance yeah. or right about how india is being depicted and oh yeah. and i guess totally. yeah it's like temple of doom indiana jones version you know yes right. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's exactly very much that but these are adventure stories i mean you know i don't right. get a hoot about um, <laughs> the depiction of right. you know it's horrible but these are stories <laughs> they're just a bit of fun but yes i mean he he does write with that vision right. um uh, right. of, no, but i guess uh, sorry i guess uh, that's that's the thing right that's the burden of literature i guess in that sense because arthur conan doyle was one of the most popular writers back then so yes. <laughs> for a lot of people who've never been to india or are haven't been exposed to say a you mm -hmm. know let's say a proper version of india for them this was it this was what india was right like Absolutely. whatever they read or read or see or you know hear yeah. Yeah. and uh and I must commend you for your uh, for the color that you've added to your books. I had absolutely no idea that you even looked at like historical weather mm -hmm. forecasts because um, like that's something that I was left wondering at the end because it's one of the only non-fiction that I've read which reads uh, just like of uh, just reads mm -hmm. like fiction. So it's just quite uh, fascinating in that. Mm -hmm. But uh, coming back to our conversation, so I'll just divert a bit from the book and yeah, sure. come to you as a person, right? So something that I have always noticed, like almost all authors, whether they write fiction or nonfiction, are voracious readers, right? And I'm sure that you are as well, like looking at the bookshelf behind you as well. So, so tell me about that. Tell me about your reading journey. Like, did you read a lot as a kid? Or would you, I don't know, how did you start reading? What did you like to read? 
Uh, we were voracious readers. My sister and I, we just read and read and read. And every Saturday, my father would take us to a bookshop. That was our treat. <laughs> and he would buy us a book. Um, so yes, we just read. And over the holidays, I used to tell my school library, you know, I need more books, <laughs> not just the six that I can take or whatever, because I, I'm also a fast reader. So mm-hmm. it was like that. And I grew up in Delhi as well. And we used to have the Apart from my books in the house, we had this Delhi public library. I don't know if it exists anymore. Uh, but yeah. the whole summer holiday, I would go there twice because I'd finished reading the book by evening and I had to go and return <laughs> it back and get it. I think I read every book over these long, boring, you know, we didn't have TV. We had nothing else to do. So I think right. that's why we just read and read and read. I read everything. I read from the classic. I mean, as a child, obviously, I read in it and did all those. Uh, then I read the classics, you know, the Austin Dickens, the whole gamut. Right. And I, I also loved um, you know, Cold War thrillers, John Le Carre, Frederick Forsyth, those were, you know, I, those are things that I enjoyed as well. So it was just a variety of things. I would literally take in all. And as I grew a little older, you know, I, I loved the Russian classics. I just love Tolstoy. Mm-hmm. I love reading Chekhov's plays because they just transport you. And what I loved is because I've always been a history buff as well. So, right. you know, the, the backgrounds, I love a big novel, which is set in a big historical background. It's something happening, you know, right. uh, Victor Hugo, those books like that, just, uh, you know, they just absorb you for hours and hours. And I right. love them. So that's, that's really been the journey. Yeah. Right. So I know it's a very sinful question to ask and people should be condemned to help with this, but I'll ask it anyway. If I ask you to name mm-hmm. five books that you really like, your, say your oh. top five books that I have to pick. I know it's very difficult because people I've been <laughs> got I've gotten a lot of hate for this from my friends and from authors who have asked this question too, but it's something I think I have to ask anyway. Well, five is really hard, but uh, okay. So I'll put my Russian classics out there. I'll put Anna Karenina. Okay. Um, you know, uh, let's, let's put it this way. Five that everyone should read. <laughs> yeah, Fair which enough. I Fair enough. <laughs> which I think everybody should read these books. Um, I love Dickens, but I'll keep, you know, okay, I'll keep him down now if we were doing five. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, I think, is like essential reading. Everybody has to read it. <laughs> it should be compulsory reading for everybody. I read it in school and I was just blown away. I read the book before I even saw the film. So, because in India, we didn't, at that time, we didn't get all these films so easily. You know, they were only right. screened in, you know, sometimes at the British Council or something. But right. I read all these books before um, I saw them as films. Um, so, yep, let's go. Uh, Anna Karenina, <laughs> uh, Killer Mockingbird. Um, Chekhov's uh, plays as well, you know, Cherry Orchard. Um, yeah. Three Sisters. Ooh, okay, only one Chekhov allowed. <laughs> I just love them. <laughs> Um, well, I won't even put Shakespeare up there because, you know, everyone's going to yes. read Shakespeare. So leave him out of this reckoning. Uh, how many have we done? Three. <laughs> um, yeah, if you can do it, I would say War and Peace because that is such a, it's a dome. It's a challenge. But, right. you know, if you if you want to sit down and do it, I think that's that's one book definitely worth reading. Right. Um, I'll, I have to throw in a uh, Austin, Jane Austen, of course. Um, I won't go for the, you know, um, Pride and Prejudice. I'll go for, um, I think I'll go for, um, oh, okay, I'll, I'll throw in Pride and Prejudice. It's the most fun. <laughs> um, I mean, I like them all. I, she's only done six books and, uh, you know, okay, we'll, we'll put in PNP in there. And uh, I will actually put in a Dickens because I like the big, the dome uh, ones, you know, I love Little right. Dorrit. Right. Um, have you done five? Because I would We're also put in George. Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay. Oh. See, this is, this is exactly, Elliot. yeah. George this is exactly Elliot why also. this is a difficult question for people. <laughs> like, and, and again, I just. Oh, what can I, you leave out? Exactly. <laughs> there's what, what can you leave out? There's absolutely fantastic kind of uh, writing that's oh, out there. So much there. Yeah. Middle March, George Eliot. I love, right. just love that book. Um, I love right. Little Dorrit. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> just try to pick the first five from these. <laughs> that's it. So uh, now just to carry forward from this. So obviously you loved a lot of fiction throughout your life, right? But Something that I realized like growing up is that a lot of 
your formative uh, growth comes from reading non fiction right like fiction does serve its own purpose but mm-hmm. uh, like you know your mental enrichment in terms of expanding your knowledge comes from yeah. non fiction so and because you're a journalist right a lot of your work does revolve around research mm-hmm. and reading and like mm-hmm. you must yeah, definitely yeah. be reading not just writing you're mm-hmm. reading non fiction as well yeah yeah, right? yeah. so where do you uh, place this you know that there's this trend around a lot of, a lot of people buy into this idea of that you know fiction is something that should be completely avoided and non fiction is what people should focus about while reading books right there's this entire I, i not that i believe in it but i have <laughs> come across it many times so just feel challenged enough about it that it is you know when when people talk about reading books as something that makes your life better or something that you should be doing it's actually talking about non fiction books and not fictitious books so is is that something you i don't think you believe in it but i would still want to hear from no. you on this <laughs> i'm very happy if people read non fiction because it's what i write <laughs> um i love history and biography i read a lot of history and biography uh, lots yeah. and lots because i just love that format and it's what i right. do as well so i i just like to read writers who are way better than me and see how they work because you know it all helps your um the way you write as well i like reading diaries uh, like you know right. books like samuel peeps diary because right. it just takes you into a world i mean what what writing how he captures these small details of say the plague you know right now right. when we are talking about um pandemics uh, right. you just see the way he captures peeps captures uh, pandemics at that time so i love reading uh, memoirs diaries written by you know these fabulous people uh way way better writers than me so you know, you get inspired by these uh but no i mean you need fiction as well you know sometimes you just need that fiction you know wolf um like um like wolf hall where she just takes you into the story and uh, right. you know you just uh, i was just listening to the audio version of it the other day and i was thinking oh my god you know just the way she deals with it it's just fantastic so yes you do need historical fiction you need fiction like i said i like the books which have a big historical context i you right. know which is why i love a war and peace or i love an anna karenina um right. with you know so much happening in the background uh and uh, you know the characters against this <laughs> if if i can make an observation actually uh now it's mm-hmm. like like this see this is exactly what i meant when i told you before we started this podcast that i really like to talk to authors and get to know the writing process because mm-hmm. something that i loved about the book was that even though it was non fiction it read like fiction like it drew me in mm-hmm. and i was just you know in this world where i was like experiencing what was happening and now while talking to you i realized like a lot of what you like is history biographies and diaries three things that you mentioned which are the closest form mm-hmm. of between fiction and non fiction right like you're reading history or a biography is essentially like reading a story reading a mm-hmm. uh, reading a work of fiction and yeah i think in a very good way that reflects in your books right in your writing mm-hmm. style and i think that is a very commendable thing because often non fiction becomes drab and you know mm-hmm. it's rare to find a non fiction which is described as you know something unput and you can't put it down at all <laughs> but so yeah well, uh, thank you very kind i think they have a new word for it it's called narrative non fiction now <laughs> that's a sort of genre <laughs> yeah. so I, if you read my book uh, you know one of my best known books of victorian abdul because it got yeah. made into a film um that is just that it's like it's based on letters and it's based on documents and it's based on people fighting in memos to each other but you know you can just bring that out because uh, you know i have vivid accounts i'm lucky that way because the the english were you know and the scots well the british they were really good at keeping records so and yeah, they wrote right. vivid diaries so i can just mine their diaries for my drama and my material because there's a scene in victoria and abdul where you know they say we're going to go on strike if you take abdul to europe with you and the staff sort of you know combine the household <laughs> uh, they combine and they come and tell victoria and she just flies into a rage and she throws everything from the table down and you know just has a real temper tantrum and this scene is described vividly in her doctor's journals so um you know that you know mrs phips went and then 
threw in everything that fell crashing down from her desk, you know, ink bottles, pens, pencils, photo frames. I had this whole image, you know, I could see it before me just from his diary. And so, of course, I helped myself to, you know, his records. And I went and stayed, um, I spent a week uh, with the doctor's descendants and I read all his journals, all his, uh, they're wow. up in Scotland. And um, that's a huge part of the source material for Victoria and Abdul. So that's what I do. You know, I, I draw on these sources uh, that bring a lot of color and newspaper reports, always newspaper reports. <laughs> I say that as a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Shermani, how does it feel to have like something where you poured your heart and soul into being turned not just into a book, like obviously you were putting it out there, but Victoria and Abdul turned into a movie. Like it's not mm-hmm. something that happens every day, right? It's not something that happens to everyone. And I'm sure it's like a, I mean, it must be a unique feeling, I guess. Right. It was. It was fantastic. And for me, like we got a lot of offers because all it just excited a lot of Hollywood studios. So there were like six top people bidding, <laughs> pitching it to me instead of me, you know, author that nobody knows, pitching right. my work. I had top studios pitching to me and I'm sitting on the other side, which was really, you know, it was a good moment. Uh, but of course, I think it was for me, the most exciting thing was the scale at which it was done because it was Universal Studios, you know, these big guys, big Hollywood budgets, big, big historical drama with big costumes, nothing tacky, you know, just reproduced beautifully down to the last detail. Um, excellent director, Stephen Trier's, you know, he made The Queen, yes. he made, you know, just fabulous. I love his work. Um, and um, Judy Dench, <laughs> you know, as Victoria. I mean, you can't ask for more. It was a dream team. So yes, right. I lived my Hollywood dream for a, you know, life for a few months, and it was fun. <laughs> and right. then back to back to being a writer. <laughs> you know. So, so just just my last couple of questions before I wrap this up. Uh, how's how's the pandemic for you? Like, I mean, did it? Uh, I mean, I know you started researching for this book back in 2015, 16. But mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. as as you mean that it a lot of it was done during the lockdowns. Mm-hmm. Well, the last edits, so right. you know the final the final bits, which are also the, the most important. You know, you right. tweak this, you tweak that. You said this chapter doesn't work here. Stick it at the back. Get rid of this. So that bit of uh, rewriting, the last bit of rewriting and editing, uh, when you're consulting with your editor as well, that happened during the pandemic. So. It was a year of doing that. And then checking the proofs, you know, all the little details. When you do nonfiction, you know, by the end of it, you're crying because footnotes are going to drive you mad. <laughs> it takes over a month to just, you know, put down the details of the footnotes. And every time I finish a book, I say, I'm, this is it. I'm not doing this again. <laughs> and of course, then I go into it. Uh, but it is, it just kills you, you know, the details of the references, because I have so many references, you know, every little all that is tedious work all that was done during the pandemic at the same time as my day job is covering it so I was covering the pandemic and writing about it you know just head full of vaccines and people dying and as well as doing this so um yeah it was everyone was very overworked (laughs) I was during the pandemic still am that's quite understandable but uh just just to just my parting question for you which uh, you sort of answered by saying that when you finish the book, you're just like, never again. But now that the book's out, what's next on the table? Do you already have a book brewing? Do you have an incident in mind to write about? Uh, no, I think the last year has been so draining. It's just been, you know, it's just killed everybody. <laughs> yeah, you know, people think that we are sitting at home and it's not. It's really stressful, you know, not being able to just step out and do something because uh, you can't and you you are confined at home. I think in Britain, we've been in lockdown forever. It's like, I think we've been locked down from October. It's just crazy. Uh, half the years, uh, you know, we came out for a bit in July, August, and then we went back. So this is the you know third wave. Uh, it's just go, going on and on. We finally be let out in May. So it's been very draining. So I need a little time just to relax, <laughs> just to, no. you know, take a flight, go to India, spend some time. I haven't seen my mother. So yeah, you know, it's been a year since I've seen her, over a year now. So I just want to do a few things that I haven't done for a year. And then, you know, something will crop up again <laughs> and uh, I'll get back. But right now I'm going to 
after this just rest for a bit just do some other things <laughs> no honestly like after this book uh, i'm sure this book was draining on all counts and but no pressures i am actually really looking forward to your next book whenever it comes out whenever you have, uh, when you come out of lockdown you've done your trip to india and you've come up with a new idea but uh, mm-hmm. thank you so much for joining us this was really wonderful i genuinely enjoyed our conversation and uh, i really look forward to talking to you soon when your next book comes out or just without okay. i take a long time to write a book so it will be five years before another comes out but thank you it's been lovely chatting with you and um, yeah technology working i hope it all comes out well so thank you <laughs> thank you for tuning in if you enjoyed this episode do subscribe to our podcast or to our youtube channel and you can check us out on instagram at the rate kitabi karwan where we keep putting up other bookish content also do write to us with any feedback or comments you have thank you